Yo, what's up guys? Hey, uh, coming back with some notes from the last video, thanks to Isaiah, brought out some good points. Um, some of the stuff I think I had thought of prior, but I didn't really talk to it in the video regarding the Bills versus the Rams. Uh, so we're going to get into some of that today. Uh, we're going to get into another pick for week one, and then maybe a look ahead to just kind of further down the season. And... One team in particular that has a lot of, uh, I guess, disadvantages or, or kind of spots where we can look to maybe be advantageous for us. So, first of all, let's get into the Bills. Uh, and I'm going to go over some of the things that he kind of mentioned in the, in the comments for the last video. So, first of all, uh, I think he, he was just mentioning that one of the examples I gave uh, was prior, I guess, prior good Josh Allen, you know, quote unquote, uh, where we kind of saw him struggle a little bit back when he had big receivers like a Zay Jones and Kelvin Benjamin and stuff like that. Just big guys. Uh, you know what? I'm sorry. I'm doing it off the top of my head. I don't remember if Kelvin Benjamin, I believe he was there, um, early with Josh Allen's career, but that note wasn't really, uh, to disparage Josh Allen or anything. That was actually in my mind, kind of a, a good thing or um, something that we can attribute to Brian Dayball, that he was smart enough to say this is not the right way to unlock Josh Allen. He needs to have quick receivers who can get some separation, not big guys he can just throw the ball up to. So, you know, hopefully that didn't, come off wrong but that's really what the kind of the message was was that Brian Dayball is one of these coordinators who is smart enough to put his guys in the right position with the right people around them to succeed and now he's no longer on the bills so whether he's going to that kind of how he set it up is going to keep being run the same way or maybe they don't know how to continue it going the same way I couldn't tell you I would hope that they it kind of took some of those notes down, or maybe he shared that with Sean McDermott, and they're able to, to keep going. But again, it's hard to say without Brian Dable actually being in the room anymore. That being said, though, obviously, I, I think Josh Allen's a great quarterback, and I think he can actually compensate for some of the maybe the deficiencies of a new offensive coordinator himself. But not having that guy in the room anymore, not having Brian Dayball there to kind of lean on and maybe make things as easy as possible for not just the quarterback, but the team is definitely going to hurt some. Uh, and you know what? On that note, I actually, the reason that we even brought up the Bills versus the Rams was because there is a an, an issue there. There's a new coordinator. Now, obviously, the coordinator is not the same as the coach, but I can tell you just from looking up the last three years, Anytime there's a head coaching change, the uh, the team struggles, at least with the season opener, and usually for the first part of the season. Now, again, this is not the head coach. McDermott's still there. It's the offensive coordinator. But if you had, if I had to put money on it, I would say that uh, Brian Dayball probably had just as big as role, if not bigger, specifically on the offensive side of the ball for the Bills. Secondly, though, um, as I did mention Isaiah did mention that the Bills' defense was number one last year in efficiency and mainly for passing attacks. They were able to shut down most people. And he's absolutely right. And I, I just kind of, you know, I didn't even mention that. One thing that I uh, kind of like to take with a grain of salt when it comes to defense, though, is the schedule. And if you look at like a DVOA, it's not just me, it's DVOA as well. It's going to take that into you know, into account. So before the season got started last year, we had the Bills ranked as the ninth easiest schedule for the season. Now, the worst teams obviously draft towards the top of your uh, of the draft. Uh, it was the Jaguars, the Lions, Texans, and Jets were the first four picks. The Bills played three out of four of these teams. They played the Jaguars, the Texans, and the Jets. Uh, the Jets, of course, they played twice. So, right there, they at least had a good stretch of games where they just had an easier schedule. Uh, but even if you go to DVOA results, uh, they actually ended up being ranked number 31, 
which you'll see right here, meaning they had the 31st easiest schedule. So that actually is a negative against them when it comes to them, <clears throat> excuse me, measuring their defense. So DVOA states they had a, a easier schedule than not. Looking at who they played, they had the easier schedule. Um, and then the prior to the season starting, they had an easier schedule. So that's not to say that their defense isn't good. I mean, they're still ranked number one for a reason, right? Because it's um, now when it's weighted for schedule, they had the third best defense. Now, even with that, again, that's not saying that they're not good. It's just saying that that was a benefit that the defense had last year. This year, especially week one, what we're talking about, they're going to be playing against the Rams. They're not playing against the Jets or the the Panthers or the Giants or whoever the hell else was was a terrible team last year. They're literally playing against the Super Bowl winners. And a lot of times when we saw them play higher-powered offenses, the defense didn't look bad, but it was nowhere near, um, you know, as successful as it was against teams like, obviously, you know, the Jaguars or the Texans, right? So... I did also kind of put the wins together. So for all of the teams that they played last year from the Bills standpoint, they played 17 games, right, or obviously. Those games or those teams they played against finished with a total record of 136, 152, and 1. So the teams that they played against all together ended up having about a 47% win, uh, win rate. So, again... I'm not trying to say that the Buffalo is not going to have a good defense. They they most likely will. It'll probably be above average. But it is very hard to repeat as that number one defense. And it's something that's very hard to do on a particular game when you're playing against a good opponent. A lot of times your defense is more dictated by the offense you're going up against and how good they can be. So that's another point of it. Uh, also, though, looking at the Rams side of the ball, so we didn't really touch a lot on the Rams and kind of how they were affected by the offseason. I mentioned mostly the Bills had lost their offensive coordinator. So the Rams defense was brought into question. The Rams defense actually did rank uh, fifth last year per DVOA. Raheem Morris was their defensive coordinator. <clears throat> Excuse me, he's still in place. Now, their schedule in comparison was 11th, which is the 11th uh, hardest, if you want to put it that way. So they actually got a little bit of a positive bump for the schedule that they played. Uh, and when it's weighted, it's about 6th. So they had a couple other things go against them, but they were still top 10 defense. So not a bad defense. Now they did lose Von Miller in the offseason. They did add Bobby Wagner, you know, trying to replace him. Um, they drafted some defensive backs. They drafted a linebacker. So eh, it was kind of a wash there other than obviously Von Miller's probably going to be missed. But not a whole lot has changed. And again, the coordinator is still the same. Obviously, their coach is still the same. So a lot of the kind of the, the bigger pieces of that defense as far as like the, the minds behind them is still going to be there. Now, that being said, um, if we go to the offensive side of the ball, because against Stafford, didn't have the best Super Bowl. Uh, he did throw three picks, but you have to remember he also lost Odell Beckham, his number two receiver, early in that game. And Odell Beckham had been tearing up the Bengals up until he got injured. Uh, he was really their go-to guy. They didn't have an answer for him, and then he loses that guy. Uh, I want to say like in the second quarter or something like that. So that definitely had an impact uh, and it definitely made the day a little bit harder for Stafford, especially because it looked like not just Stafford, but Sean McVay and the offensive side of the ball had kind of uh, pinpointed that weakness entering the game, and then they lost it. So, again, it makes things a little bit harder, and it does make it hard to kind of select one game and say, hey, look, Stafford had a hard time this time. I think he's going to have a hard time again against another good defense. Um, and, again, he definitely could. The Bills – Defense does have the great defensive backs that could give him an issue. Um, keep in mind the Rams are going to have not just Cooper Cup this year, but they're also going to have Allen Robinson in place of what was supposed to be Odell Beckham. So they're going to have the good receivers that can kind of and maybe eliminate that advantage as far as the Bills defensive back. Also, Stafford last year has a QBR of 63.8. Josh Allen had a QBR of 60.7. So 
that again can be maybe a little uh, anecdotal because some games are obviously you know they're just gonna have bad games so maybe he does have a bad game this year or this uh, week one but to say that hey he's you know I don't really trust him I could see that because we've seen it over the years with Stafford uh, but as a Ram we have not really seen him play too many bad games he's typically really been efficient uh, Let's take a look at anything else that was mentioned in that one. I think that's really about it. Those are m most of the pieces. So, uh, I apologize because he, he's right. I didn't really touch on a lot of these pieces and kind of the other point of view for that game. And we want to make sure that we're looking at both sides and how a team would win. So, if you like Buffalo, right now a lot of places are giving either uh, Buffalo versus the Rams as a pick'em or it's Buffalo plus one. If you like Buffalo and you think, you know what, I believe that their defense is going to step up and they're going to give Stafford a hard time, and I don't believe in the trend that says Thursday night games, the home team wins if we believe they're going to be above 500 and only loses 13% of the time, and if you believe uh, that the Bills' offense is still going to be able to overcome the loss of Brian Dayball and they're going to kind of keep on going with what they were doing and that they'll be able to pull out this win, I would say do not take the Bills plus the one point because uh, there's really not a big difference there between that and a pick em. Either go money line on the Bills, which is kind of a lower money line because it's only one point, or find a team to tease them with. And you can tease them up to the seven or even up to the seven and a half if you want to to get through the key number. I myself would only go to it, so just to the seven. Um, and you can find another team to tease with them, whether you want to tease the Colts down or you uh, to like two because it's, they're opening up against the Texans or possibly tease the Cowboys up to eight because they're playing against the Buccaneers. A couple other teams that would be uh, kind of advantageous just from a crossing key numbers standpoint that you could tease the Bills with. So if you still like the Bills and you believe, you know what, I think that they really can't overcome these and beat the Rams and kind of pull out that upset for week one, by all means, I would say to do it through the teaser. Uh, that way you get the most efficient route through there. If you don't, um, I can tell you I'm still going to be leaning with the Rams. I don't really have a dog in this fight. You know, I like Sean McVay, but that has not kept me from betting against him in the past. Um, the only thing I will say, if you like the Rams, is that Stafford has not been throwing. Now, it's only May, so we have four months. It's probably going to be a non-story by the time we actually get to the game. But he has not been thrown because he took an injection in the elbow. So that's never a good thing. But again, it's four months. If he's going to have something done, if he's going to have injections or whatever, this is the time of year you want them to be doing that to get everything ready so that once kickoff comes around, he's good to go. My assumption is by week one, he's ready to play. He didn't have any you know, major injuries or anything like that. So there's really no reason that he should be suffering once we get to the actual kickoff here. Uh, so enough about that one. Let's go ahead and get into the next thing I wanted to talk about. And that's actually, uh, well, let me say, Washington is one of the teams I want to talk about. But I want to give you guys a stat before we go too much further. Because this year, you may not have noticed, there are a lot of new head coaches and just new coaching staffs in general uh, entering the season and I'm going to go over a few of them with you right now and I apologize I don't have this written down on my screen so you have to just listen it first listen to me for a second maybe write this down uh, obviously Brian Dayball like I said he's left the bill so he's the head coach of the Giants Dennis Allen is the new head coach of the Saints the Bears have hired Matt Eberflus he is a at, with the Bears they have an entirely new coaching staff same thing with the Giants. So it's not just your head coach. They have every everybody in there is new. The Broncos have uh, Nathaniel Hackett. Again, all new coaching staff. Uh, the I believe that maybe their defensive coordinator stayed, but the offensive coordinator and the head coach are both um, coming to the Broncos from the Packers. The Texans have Lovey Smith as their coach, but he's also going to be operating as their defensive coordinator, and they did get a new offensive coordinator. So, in essence, they have an entirely new coaching staff. Jaguars did hire Doug Peterson with a new uh, OC as well. The Raiders hired an entirely new coaching staff with Josh McDaniels as their head coach. The Dolphins hired Mike uh, Mike McDaniel. The Vikings hired Kevin O'Connell. He's going to also be calling the offensive plays. 
Uh, he was previously with the Rams as their passing core, as their offensive coordinator, uh, and prior, prior to that, he was their passing game coordinator. Uh, also, the Buccaneers hired Todd Bowles to take the place of Bruce Arians. That's kind of a, that's a little bit of a different story because he was with the team. He just moved from defensive coordinator to head coach. So, hopefully, not a huge change there. But I can tell you from prior experience, Todd Bowles is definitely a defensive-minded coach. Now, that being said, Tom Brady's obviously still in the broom. So, does Tom Brady maybe outweigh Tom Bowles, which sounds ridiculous? But it's Tom Brady, and I don't think Tom Brady's going to let Todd Bowles ruin that offense. So, I don't really want <clears throat> to use the Buccaneers in this stat I'm going to give you, but he's there. So, going back for the last three years... If you look at head coaching changes, and there's there were a few, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, back in 2019, though I believe it's about five or six of them. First year head coaches in their season openers are 5, 14, and 1. That's a 25% win, 25% win rate. Their average losing margin is 13.92 points. So they average on average lose by about 14 points. They average a score of about 19.4 points, or because there's a few of those games where those head coaches are playing against each other. So I believe it was 2020, and I can actually uh, kind of get into some of that here. And no, actually, I apologize. It was 2021, where some of the head coaches, uh, the brand new head coaches, played against fellow rookie head coaches in the season openers. And so some of those wins and some of those games were really new head coach versus new head coach. So if we take out some of those games or if we take out all of those games, the average score for the season opener of a first-year head coach goes down to 17.72 points. And of the five wins that they got, so again, they were 5-14-1, and one, of the five wins that these brand-new head coaches got, all of those wins came against what would be eventual sub-500 teams, a.k.a. losing teams. So if you're looking at this schedule and you see that, you know, let's say the Dolphins are playing the Patriots week one, we may want to look to bet the Patriots because we're expecting the Patriots to be above 500 and yeah, first-year head coaches have not been able to beat in an above 500 team in the last three years. Also, of those five wins, two of those wins, like I said, came against fellow rookie head coaches. And one of those wins came against the backup quarterback. So actually, it was last year, uh, Brian Staley, the or Brandon Staley, the Chargers' brand new head coach, beat Washington 7-10 in his season opener. However, if you think back to that game, that's the game that Ryan Fitzpatrick started for Washington, but he got hurt, I believe, in the second quarter. So most of the game was played with the backup quarterback and obviously totally changed what was going on with the Washington offense. So I bring this all up now because, like I said, the Patriots and Dolphins is one that I really, really love uh, and that I'm probably going to be smashing that game. And there's really just a few more notes on that game in particular. Uh, for example, the Patriots obviously are going to have Bill Belichick, right? He's one of the best coaches to ever really you know, step in the NFL. Um, the Dolphins, obviously, like I said, they have a new head coach. They have a new uh, offensive coordinator. And on the trend that I just gave you right now, doesn't really look good for head coaches, especially because uh, our new head coaches because we do expect the Patriots to be an above 500 team. Last year, the Patriots lost by one point to the Dolphins in their season opener, and that was with rookie Mac Jones in his first start, first game ever. And if you remember, they had just released Cam Newton, I believe like one or two weeks prior to this game. So Mac Jones had not had a whole lot of experience leading that team, and they lost by one point, and it was because of a very late fumble by, I believe, Damian Harris, who ended up icing the game because they should have won with a field goal or possibly punched it in towards the end of the game. But either way, they lost that game. Prior to that, though, the three years prior to that, Patriots had not lost a season opener. Now, obviously, that was with Tom Brady, so kind of take that with a grain of salt. 
But also, last year, the Patriots had an entire turnover with just about everything from Tom Brady to receivers to defensive players to everywhere across the board. They had big turnovers. Uh, they had huge signings with tight ends with Johnny Smith and Hunter Henry. Obviously, that did not happen this year. They didn't have to do like a full makeover you know, of that offense or of the team. Mac Jones steps into his second year. Um, the other algorithm that we use, and obviously we're not using it right now, is the Madden algorithm. We're not using it right now because the new Madden stats haven't come out, and they won't come out until closer to kickoff time. But going off of last year, uh, Mac Jones was rated as the better quarterback from Tua. The team was rated higher than the Dolphins. And as far as DVOA is concerned, because one thing that did concern me is the Dolphins were really, really good on the defensive side of the ball at stopping the run, and that's exactly what the Patriots like to do. So I did want to look that up. The Dolphins actually ended up being 10th in DVOA. As far as rushing DVOA, though, they were only 17th. So not as good as I remembered. I did believe that I thought that they were better than that entering the season or exiting the season, I guess I should say. But not uh, in actuality. So aside from that, though, if you take a look at their scheduling, they actually play the 30th uh, hardest or the second, the third easiest schedule. Uh, so that's a bad DVOA to have when you had such an easy schedule. So I really don't see a whole lot of uh, points in the Dolphins' favor here. And if that wasn't enough, let me just say this. The favorite for this team or for this game is actually the Dolphins. The Dolphins are laying three points entering week one with a new head coach with what should be a worse team on paper. Yes, they got Tyreek Hill. Can Tua get him the ball? Is the new coach going to use him the right way? Is a new offensive coordinator going to lay it out the right way? Are they still going to be kind of a defensive-minded, you know, first kind of team? Brian Flores, I thought, had a, had a good good thing going when they let him go. But how much of that is going to be changed and how much of that is going to be overcome uh, or can be overcome when you're going up against Pabellacek? So that all being said... I'm loving the Patriots week one. It's Patriots plus three. I would grab that while you can because as we get closer to kickoff time here, I do believe you're going to see money coming in on the Patriots. Uh, and it's probably going to be down to like Patriots minus two and a half, minus two, and three is, of course, the key number. So grab it while you can. Um, assuming that the media doesn't start hyping up Tua, which I don't think that they will. There's really only one way this line is going to go. So you, this one is one you're going to want to jump on sooner than later. So just kind of in essence there, grab the Patriots plus the three points while you can. Last thing here, guys, and like I said, Washington is the team I wanted to talk about. Specifically their later um, part of the season. We did mention kind of rest advantages, disadvantages last week. The part of the season that that really comes into play though is the end of the season you know if you have maybe a day or two that you're kind of having a disadvantage with the first second third fourth you know week of the season probably not a big deal um if it's maybe even like towards the middle of the season maybe you just had a bye week maybe you're you know coming off of something maybe you had some injuries that are getting healed up still not a huge deal at the end of the season though is really where this becomes a problem um, especially if your team is not like an already great team, if it's just a kind of 500 or maybe kind of you know floating around there kind of team, um, and you're having to overcome some talent issues, or maybe just having not the best uh, coaches around you. Don't get me wrong; I think Ron Rivera is a great coach. I think he's done a great job with Washington, but I don't think that their team is all that strong. That being said, they have a lot of rest disadvantages come the end of the season and I believe it starts week 10 and we're going to go over that but also they have one um, I guess advantage or one good spot that we want to take a look at them so let me start with that if you notice on their schedule December 4th they're going to play the Giants in New York this is actually one of those games they have a rest disadvantage and they are coming uh, or say the Giants are coming off of a mini buy that week so they are going to be at a disadvantage, and they're playing in New York. So 
if I had to say, I would tell you that's probably a bad spot for Washington. But after this game, they're going to go on their bye, and then they're going to play New York um, again in Washington. Now, when we see this where it's just, you know, two opponents, a bye, and then the two opponents play again, what usually happens? Well, if we take a look at the stats here from the last few years at this point, I believe it's about four years worth of stats, uh, the amount of time it goes by definitely impacts the winner of the second game. So this is looking at it from the, the standpoint of the winner of the first game. So if you win the first game and you play again in two weeks, which is the shortest you could do it, so it's again by and then you play the same opponent, the winner of the first game only uh, wins 26% of the time, and they only cover the spread 30% of the time. So if the Giants win that first game, Washington is going to cover the spread 70% of the time. That's a huge number. That's probably the biggest nugget I've ever dropped on these videos uh, to have 70% winner against the spread. Now, with that being said, obviously it's 70%. It's not 100%, but there are some other advantages that Washington has as far as that first game being against them. For example, the Giants had many by like we were saying, so that's why Washington has the rested disadvantage uh, prior to that game, obviously. So New York has that little bit of advantage a couple days. And this is a week 13, so this is already later in the season when it actually does matter to have that rest advantage. And this is the second rest disadvantage game for Washington. The first rest disadvantage game that they see is actually week 10 uh, against the Eagles here on November 14th. So same thing, the Eagles are coming off of their uh, mini buy at that point, or maybe their full buy. I apologize, I don't have it here in front of me. But either way, the Washington uh, Commanders are going to have a rest disadvantage that week. They'll have two more games, then another rest disadvantage versus the Giants. So both of those, I don't want to say they're automatic bet against for Washington, but it's definitely not a good spot for them. Uh, if anything, I'd be looking to take the Giants in this spot in particular. Um, but with all those advantages, then we see a flip because then Washington has to buy after this game. The Giants did not. The Giants have another game. And then they play the Washington, or Washington plays the Giants again, this time at home. So not only are they at home in the second one, the second game of the rematch, they also have uh, the rest advantage. They just had their bye week. And typically, when this happens, you see the coaches in that bye week kind of reevaluate what's going on, maybe change up their styles and things like that. So, assuming that they lose that first game, which in, in a certain sense, I'm kind of hoping that they do, because if they win, it may be a, uh, obviously a disadvantage for them, given the stats. But, assuming that they lose that first game, Ron Rivera and his crew go into that bye week, knowing that they're going to come right back out and play the Giants again. They're going to make changes, they're going to make some, you know, some stylistic changes, and kind of do things differently to get the win the second time around, where the Giants are not going to have that advantage, are not going to have the time to make any changes or, or tweaks or anything like that. So we would expect the you know, Washington to come out and win that second game. So kind of back and forth with the betting on Washington. Now they continue forward though with two more rest disadvantages to end out the season. Uh, on December 24th, they play the 49ers. The 49ers are coming off of their mini buy, and then they're going to play the Cowboys on January 8th. And I believe the Cowboys had the prior Thursday night game as well. So they're going to end the, the season with two out of three rest disadvantage spots. So just kind of keep these games in mind as we get later to in the season because you're probably going to want to take advantage of these uh, as well as, of course, the trends that are kind of laying out for you on that back-to-back uh, -back with the Giants. So I wanted to highlight that because I don't really hear a lot of people talk about that. And again, I know it's May, so you're not there's not a whole lot of football talk out there right now. But even as we get to the season, even as we get to the game, you really don't see a lot of talk about this. And if they mention it, in a you know back to back kind of matchup, a lot of times it's just kind of like oh we just saw these two games and you know this is what we saw so let's let's expect that, that first team is going to win again and, and even even if somebody were to be like oh maybe it's not an advantage to play the game right after a bye, 
nobody really gives you any numbers on it so i wanted to kind of highlight these for you guys hopefully that was helpful um also the patriots pick is probably gonna be my favorite pick for that week one game i do not understand why it patriots plus three so i'm telling you right now and i'm calling this again almost four months out I, I'm almost positive I have my favorite pick of the week for week one uh, already set. So, again, I haven't laid money on any of these just yet, um, but it's getting to be very enticing, and I want to kind of put some money on that before that line moves. So, if you want to beat me to it, by all means, go ahead and do so. Uh, but I'm, again, almost positive that's going to be my favorite play of week one, uh, and just looking forward to bill totally destroying the dolphins and and taking advantage of Tua. so now hopefully the line does stay longer so we can kind of double up on it as we get you know later into the season especially if the media does start hyping up uh like a tyreek hill to Tua kind of thing or Jalen waddle and Tua, or whatever it is uh, so maybe there will be some pushback on it but either way i've kind of laid out my case for it so Hopefully, again, this guy uh, was beneficial, informational, and you saw something you like or don't like. Let me know in the comments below if there's something you don't agree with or something that I just totally missed. Uh, but see you again next week.